Hello and welcome to The Right Idea, where we discuss the people, policy, and politics that drive Texas. I'm your host, Brian Phillips. I'm the Chief, Chief Communications Officer at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And with me, as always, is our Vice President of Research, Derek Cohen. Derek, we're back. We're doing it. Where it's 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 the um, the end of or middle of April now. We've got a couple months coming up. The, the Olympics are coming. That's a huge, mm-hmm. you know, it's a huge event for America. It's a huge uh, unifying event for the most part, I think, uh, for most Americans and get excited. I even like, ho- I even like soccer during during, during the Olympics, because I'll watch that and root for the Americans. Um, do you get in the Olympics? Are you watch it? Are you a fan? Yeah, most mostly. Uh, I t- kind of air t- more towards uh, Winter Olympics, just because I'm a big, big hockey guy. But yeah, the Summer Olympics are definitely enjoyable. Well, did you know that there are new sports this year? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I loosely use the word sport in this one. I want to ask you about one to see if you are interested in this. Apparently, uh, break dancing is mm-hmm. now going to be an Olympic sport. Uh, which I, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, are scratching their heads as to like, you know, is that a sport? Why is that a sport? Are we going to have ballroom dancing next? I mean, what it really opens up, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about athletic sports and things like that versus just sort of, I guess, movement athletic activities, uh, not even athletic. Um, what is your take? You think you think break dancing is a sport? A- absolutely. I think you got to also look. <laughs> I think you got to also look at some of the other sports that come. You know, they added rugby sevens uh, a couple year, a uh, couple. I think actually, I think it was the last Summer Olympics. They added rugby sevens, which obviously nobody would, uh, uh, you know, say that's not that's a, sport. a sport. Yeah, yeah. And so, just kind of experimenting. I know that they're going to add esports as well, where I think that's kind of where it gets uh, to the periphery. But at least there's some you know, sort of like competition. I don't know. You know I don't, have you ever seen? Well, I mean, there was a great sports documentary that came out in the '80s called Breaking Two: Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> and I, mean, and I was I, a huge fan as an eight-year-old. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like Hoosiers. You know, Field of Dreams, Breaking Two. You know, it's all, again, co-equal, right, Chance? So, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm looking for. Now, I, actually, I mean, you can't even keep that joke going. But, um, you know, it, it's it's interesting that they're experimenting things like that. And, hey, if you're going to put something like that uh, outlandish as a sport, might as well do it in France, So right? if you win the gold, do you save the gym at the, <laughs> at the end of the Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> from the evil corporation that was going to, yeah, yeah, exactly, it's, exactly. Yeah, it, I was going to make a king of the mountain joke, but uh, two, two things I have on this. One, I think this is just the Americans. The Americans know that like there's not a large, you know, Chinese or Russian contingent of break dancers. Perhaps I would imagine. So my and so this is just a way for us to steal an Olympic uh, gold here. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, well, more than watch? one gold because I assume there's probably like doubles competitions. <laughs> there's co-ed. Yeah, th- think about like the broken down box. Box production that'll come from this, you know, <laughs> and old school eighties boom boxes. All right, moving on to more important stuff. Moving on I, to the. I will watch. As someone born in the eighties, I will watch. I will. I will watch anything that America can win. I will yes. watch for about right. Exactly. As, as long as we're winning, that would be the yeah. really embarrassing thing is that we actually if we lost. Lose, if we lose, and <laughs> the break Swedish dancing. break dancing team just <laughs> overwhelmed I, us. I was, I was about to say, you know, don't sleep on Palau. You know. <laughs> The Fiji breakdancing team. All right. Um, all right. So, shameless promotions, as I always like to do. Um, our newsletter, our big weekly newsletter, is called The Post. It's always got exclusive inf- uh, exclusive writings um, right at the top for me and others that uh, that contribute to it. It's kind of a compilation of all the things that we do here at TPPF and all the hot takes like these, uh, like breakdancing that we might have that we publish uh, throughout the week and throughout the month. Uh, it's called The Post. You can get it at texaspolicy.com slash The Post. If you're not signed up for it, please do. All right. Now, let's get to the reason why we're all here, which is is our guest interview um, is with one of our TPPF lawyers. In fact, the, the head of our litigation center, Chance Weldon, is our senior attorney and the director of litigation for the Center for the American Future. Chance, thanks for being on with us today. Glad to be here. So what we want to get into is squatting, this this issue of squatting. And I don't, I mean, the fact that we're even here talking about it is pretty amazing because it's really come out, you know, there were some issues that had happened, I think, in the winter of, of last year, but it really over the last like mm-hmm. 60, 90 days has become, it's kind of taken over the country as becoming one of the one of the issues. Um, uh, and I want to go through some of the stories and kind of get your, your, your take on this, but it has gotten to be such an issue that now even the Senate's, uh, the Dan Patrick Lieutenant Governor has added it to his interim charges. So this yeah. is one of the issues that they're going to be studying now in preparation for next session just to make sure that Texas's laws are tight and that um, there's no issues with, you know, property rights issues or that the kind of things that we'll talk about here are going to be on their way to Texas. And so it is it is a it is a big issue. And I know TPPF is going to be doing some research on it and coming mm-hmm. out with some policy proposals as well. But let me just get your first take. I mean, I think the thing the reason why this is such an issue for people is because 
how could this possibly happen? How could you own property? How could you have a house that you own or a business in this case and some of these other stories and people just break into the place and yeah. decide that it's now theirs and, and, and believe, I think this is the real part that blows people's minds is, and now believe that they would have some actual legal protection for this kind of activity. How does that happen, Chan? Yeah, this is a perfect example of, <clears throat> of unintended consequences of laws that had nothing to do with squatting. So I, I think you're right. Every Texan, every American believes that if you just show up to your house and there's some random dude sitting in your <laughs> living room that you can make that trespasser leave. And if you read the laws of trespass in Texas, that's exactly how they read. But over the years, whether it be New York or some of these other states or even in Texas, there were protections put in for renters to stop, to make it more difficult to evict people um, or remove people from rental properties mm -hmm. um, whenever they're staying there. And it just, there's this whole process that's built in to make it more difficult and more time consuming to evict people. And what folks have realized is if they just show up to a vacant house, they can invoke the protections of these laws that were designed mm -hmm. to protect renters and make it difficult to remove someone who just showed up at the house. Oh, let me just ask you about that. I mean, is there, you know, could you defend that? I mean, is there a legitimate case where you have, I don't know, some slum landlord or something like that that's basically trying to kick people out um, and, and doing it in some nefarious way? I mean, are there, are there legitimate reasons for these, at least these original laws that would, that would protect renters? I mean, I think you'd have to go on a law by law basis, but I think that's where the core of it started was mm -hmm. this idea that there needs to be some process to make sure that when people are being evicted from uh, a tenancy or their their lease is getting canceled that there be some sort of due process protection for those families mm -hmm. that are in those homes and look it's a, it's a classic example of public choice theory right you have voters people that rent vote you know there's a huge particularly in urban areas a huge portion of the population that vote for local laws they're renters they're going to want these sort of procedural protections mm -hmm. to stop them from being evicted but over time, what you see is like so many things, and Derek can, of course, attest to this, who works with the ledge, it's not like ordinances and laws are written with the utmost precision and care. <laughs> huge if true. Yeah, huge <laughs> if true. And as a result, it creates these these situations where there, is in, there are incentives now for people to just sit down in someone's house. And I do, Derek, I want to get to um, uh, kind of w whether or not you think, in, in your initial research, uh, you think uh, Texas's laws are tight enough for this. But the but the but one of the one of the big stories that kind of took the country's, or kind of capture the country's imagination, um, and this is an interesting legal theory on the part of the squatter, is that a, a couple bought a, I think it was a $5 million, a $2 million home, um, and only to find that someone who claims that the previous owner who then died said he could stay there in the house so the 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 owner you know the, the current the previous owner has this person in there says you can come says you can stay but then that person dies and of course the state for whatever reason uh, they sell the house now the couple shows up and they've got this squatter do you think i mean is that is that is that a different kind of legal issue is that a different kind of or a tougher kind of way because now they're they're actually claiming yes you know i've got some legal claim to this because the previous owner allowed me to stay here no so that, that brings up a very good point so that's what's known specifically in property law as a lie <laughs> um, and so, is it a technical term? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah you, you know, chance we don't want to like you know go go back to the one L two L. That's a lot of legalese. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? I don't know. Let's, let's tone it down for the people. But but all, all joking aside, it's no, it's that, that, that holds absolutely no water because the conveyance of ownership of the property is with the documentation there too. For it's also why we pay, you know, these uh, you know ridiculous title insurance. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, mandated title insurance payments because that is actually a point of, you know, the, the hygiene necessary to transfer the deed. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that you've seen and that you mentioned is when there is a claim uh, that, you know, somehow justifies the adverse possession, right? And so... That just does not hold water at all for me because, again, that individual has nothing but the word of someone who is deceased, giving them the most credit possible <laughs> um, to back up their claim. And even if let's even say that that did happen, that does not actually affect the ownership interest through the traditional channels. Mm -hmm. Chance, one of the ones, uh, the other big story that kind of made this explode because now we've got some celebrity involved is, is of course, celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay. He's got a hotel slash restaurant that he has over in London that um, they haven't done anything with. And so people just decided it's in a really ritzy part of town and he's either trying to sell it or renovate it or whatever. He's trying to do something with the property. Um, well, uh, 
a half a dozen folks just decided, well, if you're not going to do anything with it, then we are. And so not only did they break and enter and they've been living in it or whatever, now they've actually turned it into some sort of uh, a community art center and are like selling coffee out, you know, or I guess they're giving coffee away or 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 whatever. Um, yeah, selling cap or selling coffee is a little too capitalistic, right? <laughs> right. So they're just, they're just giving it yeah. away. Um, but they're but they're you know they're basically saying, well, you're not using it, so we've now you know we've now just decided that this is going to be our space. And they're posting you know um, uh, pronouncements that you know if you come in here, you'll be violating our rights, or if you try to kick us out, that the law is on our side. I mean, this is this is crazy. Yeah. So that's in England. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think, not that you're steeped in the. No, I, I just, I just feel like that the that, that uh, the folks in 1776 in America would not be surprised that the, the English protections for property rights are not as good as you would prefer. But <laughs> there's a whole Third of, Amendment about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so instead of throwing away the tea, they're just handing it out for free. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So I think I think that's a, that that's a real problem. You know, you don't get to just walk into someone's property and say, I think I could use it better. Mm -hmm. The word for that, like you said earlier, the very complex legal word for that is theft, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Like if I just take your stuff because I think I could use it better, Mm -hmm. that's theft. And and again, this is taking advantage of procedures that weren't designed to Mm -hmm. deal with this, but have created a legal bureaucracy that makes it very difficult to get thieves and trespassers out of private And, and this is where they sort of expose themselves as really being Marxist and, and yeah. communist, right? Because their justification is that they're you that this is better for the community or right. that we or that we have decided, we have taken upon ourselves to make use of this and therefore because it's better for the community, therefore they should be allowed to stay there and, and, and have it. Look, uh, the whole purpose of having private property is someone else doesn't get to decide what would be better for the community with my private property. That's, <laughs> I'm sure that, that there are a great many things that someone else might want to do with my home, mm-hmm. right? But the fact that it's mine means that I get to make those Not decisions. Not to get off track here, but you do a lot of cases like that um, in, in defending private property owners yeah. uh, here in Texas when even in, in, in certain instances, I know like the, the Schlitterbahn New Braunfels case about people saying, well, we, we would like you to do something else with your property uh, because we're in the community and we don't like what you're doing with it. Yeah, that's a big part of our litigation, whether it be like protecting short-term rental owners and then the, then the people in the community decide, well, we don't want short-term rentals. We think it would be better as a long-term rental or we think it would be better if someone else owned it or, you know, <laughs> you know, or the the monies down in San Marcos who wanted to remove a, a, an initial from the front of their home and the mm-hmm. city said, well, we think it looks better. So you have to keep the initial up and we <laughs> represent property owners in those sorts of cases all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one issue I want to get into, uh, maybe you both your remarks on this is, is its connection to housing affordability. This is obviously something that is a huge issue. Uh, we did some polling recently and over 70% of Texans believe that, that, that housing affordability is already into a crisis. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the connection? Is there a connection? chance there between you know the the root of this being that housing isn't affordable and so not that that gives you the right to go in and break into someone's unused property but but maybe it's a derivative of of that yeah i mean for sure the reason that we have this problem i think in large part is because we do have a housing affordability crisis and the reason we have a, a housing affordability crisis is because local governments through their zoning laws have made it illegal to build housing. Mm -hmm. It is illegal and prohibitively expensive to build affordable housing. And if you want housing to be affordable, you have to stop making it illegal. And Mm -hmm. so this government created problem has forced people in some situations to to create creative ways to to, (laughs) to find places to live. And the, the solution, of course, is in both cases, property rights. All right, Derek, are you shocked to hear that, that government is at the is at the root? Government, bad government policy is at the root of some of this? Uh, I don't know. I was just talking to James Quintero earlier, and he said the government's just doing an absolutely great job. And if anything, we're paying superintendents too little. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, it, before before y'all got here, I was I was talking to Jefferson, you know, just sitting around talking about what most guys uh, talk about, the film adaptation of Les Mis. Um, and uh, you I know, came I, in on the wrong part of that conversation. <laughs> well, no, and I, I, I bring that up because I, I think that that what is implicit uh, and what, what Chance hit on, and then the justification that we see from some of the more sympathetic local and, and state level elected officials is that th- these are all these Jean Valjean types are stealing a loaf of bread to, to, to you know feed their family when it's not. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's these are crimes of opportunity, mm-hmm. and sometimes crimes of opportunity being. Uh, 
uh, undertaken by folks with the means to not have to do that. Completely agree with Chance's diagnosis that this is a self-inflicted wound by uh, by local governments. And not only that, I'll yes and that by saying that the affordability crisis has then deepened by their reckless uh, spending, wherein, you know, they just, you know, keep raising tax rates mm-hmm. and raising tax rates. You know, we go back to the uh, the old example that we read in The Statesman, where, you know, that one individual was complaining. She's like, I don't understand why I'm getting taxed out of my home. I voted for every bond to make this a good community. And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't know what you tell you these just people. just answers your own question. Yeah. And not to get conspiratorial there, but you mentioned, you know, these aren't, these aren't the Jean Valjean types, you know, they're, but, but, but it does feel like there is a coordinated effort here mm. that, I mean, especially with the Gordon Ramsay thing, it mm. feels, you know, these aren't just people who are like, hey, there's a door I can break into and let's go, you know, start serving the community coffee. It feels a little mm. more coordinated than that. It feels almost, I wouldn't say sophisticated, but the fact that you have people calling themselves professional squatters, mm. Derek, do you think that, I mean, do you, th- I mean, do you see any evidence of coordination or is this, or has this been always kind of under the, 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 the uh, the radar and now that you've got a Gordon Ramsay or someone that's being affected by it now it's kind of popping up. Are these professional squatters like part of the the union? I mean, are they you know like I mean <laughs> the squatters? They're, 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 they're still on they're still on the rookie contracts. The squatters or, union. Yeah, yeah. but that, no, that's I, when they truly eat themselves is when they you know they have these communist you know Marxist organizations and now we unionize. Yeah. So well, we can talk about that later. Um, but no, I I honestly I I don't I. I have not seen enough to suggest that that it would be coordinated. Um, but like I said, whenever it comes, uh, cri- whenever you have a crime of opportunity like like that, there are always opportunists. Mm-hmm. And I think that we, you know, we don't, only reason we know of the Gordon Ramsay one obviously is because of the, the celebrity of it. What you're not hearing about is you know somebody's house in the suburbs in Dallas or uh, Fort Worth or something like that because it just doesn't rise to the, the the level of public consciousness but the point is and to emphasize what uh Chance has said is that we basically have created the entire western system of government on the preface that the, a free citizen can own property mm-hmm. and that is because, and that's why I think there's this 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 visceral reaction against this kind of wave whether it's again whether it's uh, organic or non-organic of, of this wave of squatting simply because it is so anathema to the way we order our society mm-hmm. that if somebody can divest you of a property interest simply by existing in a particular space, then what is it? What, what are we even doing this for? Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if anyone's just bought a house, I mean, you have that, you know, a closing, the very two, three hour process sometimes of all of the things that, that yeah. go into the transfer of that little quarter lot or whatever it is that you bought uh, into your possession, all the things you have to sign, all the things you have to declare. Um, and then what, you know, what, what the, what the community is actually allowed to do. So in terms of the utilities and things like that, about them being able to get on your property, it's very clear who owns the property. So to make to make a point on the, the question that you asked, Derek, I think this is a perfect example of two alternative views about how to deal and what the cause and what the solution is to housing affordability. Mm-hmm. There's one view that's always been on the left, that the reason that people don't have housing is some rich fat cat is hoarding stuff and someone needs to take their property. Mm-hmm. And that's what squatting looks like. It is a physical manifestation of that ideology. On mm-hmm. the other side, there's been for years the idea that the reason that we have an affordability crisis is the government's not letting people do what they want with their property. They're not letting people build. And if you want housing to get cheaper, you got to just build more of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you have in in the squatting scenario what's literally a physical manifestation of those two competing views of philosophy. One that says we should steal other people's stuff and one that says we should let people use their property. And I think the moral side of that argument is the one that doesn't involve, you know, stealing people's stuff. I <laughs> uh, want to get into the the Texas response uh, to the to the squatting and in in tradi- you know in, in true Texas tradition of, of a state that's you know national state motto is well it's not the official state motto but we're the come and take it state of course um, you know there's a lot of bravado and a lot of you know chest um, puffing I guess um, out there saying you know it's not going to happen here it's not going to happen in Texas and we have very strong uh, property rights uh, laws which we'll get into in a second but Abbott did tweet the 
the governor did tweet, uh, in Texas, anyone squatting in your home is breaking the law. They are criminals violating Texas laws like criminal trespass and criminal mischief. Also, the Texas Castle Doctrine empowers Texans to use force to defend themselves and their property. Um, so he's basically saying our laws protect property yeah. rights owners. Anybody, you know, don't bring that mess in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to get into what he he did. He refers to mm-hmm. the the Texas Castle Doctrine um, that empowers Texans to use force to defend themselves and their property. There were some articles about this after Abbott had tweeted, and there were certain lawyers who suggested that that might not be as airtight as we think. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, you you still need to have a a uh, credible threat. Uh, before you can use force to defend yourself, Chance, you say that's that's not the case. So two two big disclaimers. First, as any lawyer will tell you, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> and second, I'm not giving anyone criminal legal advice. Okay, right? Those, this right. is not criminal legal advice. But I think this is a good example. Okay, of, what would you do if you found a squatter in your house? Let's so, do it that so I think that's so the, the, the <laughs> you'd be the, looking for criminal legal advice. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the Texas the Texas Castle Doctrine. If I just came home and there was strange people in my home. Right. Certainly, I don't have to wait for them to attack me to try and remove them from my home. Physically remove them. To physically remove mm-hmm. them from my home. There's a strange person in my home, and this, I mean, this goes back all the way to John Locke. Right. If someone's in my home, I don't have to. I, the presumption is that they mean to do me harm, and I don't have to guess about that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, um, any sort of advice on that abstract theory. You know, it's going to have to meet the rubber is going to meet the ra- road somewhere and somebody yeah. can get charged with assault and somebody can get charged with murder. And the question is, do you want to have that abstract legal theory as your protection against a criminal charge when you, you know, physically remove yeah. someone from their home? And that is where the problem comes up. Well, also on those articles that you're mentioning, I don't know where they found some of these law professors because because what, what you said really makes sense in terms of actually, you know, parsing out the nuance of the application of the cancel doctrine. But one of these law professors just went and said like, oh, well, no, you have an affirmative duty to retreat. And it's like, that is explicitly what the castle doctrine does away with right, right. to that point. And so I retreat from your own house yeah. while it, someone is, is Well, there is are some states with that there are some states where that is true. Yeah. Where that is the case. Sure, not Texas. Yeah, not th- Texas. these are also states where you're probably not going to be shooting them anyway cuz you can't have guns like hot <laughs> cough New York. Um but um so, well, uh, things like that. Can you write a sternly worded letter to the squatter? Yeah, <laughs> like like, in a, like a Wes Anderson communique, you know? Yeah, Just, exactly. Um, from outside your window, please leave. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm getting really serious. Get out of my house. So you know, so but there, but there's a difference. There's a difference, and I think this is some of the point that, that they were making. There's a difference between I open up my door and there's a strange person in my house, and. I have someone who overstays their lease, and therefore I just show up and try and drag them out. Right. right I mean, right. those are very different things, and right. I think that's what the what the law professor to give to steel man their argument. I think yeah. that's what they're making. <laughs> I think you're being very generous, uh, steel manning a law professor's that's, argument. That's what I'm known for, Chance uh, Weldon, generosity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're gonna have to cut that out, Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Um, but that's, but but I think that but that kind of pivots to the the, the policy discussion that that's yeah, going to need yeah. that's going to need to happen. And and to be honest with you and I definitely applaud Governor Abbott's um you know, his tweet. Re- resolve on yeah, his, well, as manifest by the tweet, but his resolve on the issue. Um, and I also got to say, I think uh, I think Governor DeSantis handled it pretty well too with uh, what they put through in Florida, which basically just said, you know, you can go basically have a, a you know, an ex parte hearing and if you can produce evidence before a judge, like the minute that uh, the minute that gavel comes down, the sheriff's going to your house to, to remove those uh, to remove those people. Yeah. But also within that law, there also is an off ramp for individuals that might be subject to like if it was ever up for a lease and that's something that needs to be adjudicated. There's that particular exception that exists. So to Texas policy, the Senate Senate's interim charges just came out. Essentially, that's just the list of uh, research projects that mm-hmm. the the leaders of the House and the Senate um, uh, give to the various committees of jurisdiction uh, to say, hey, here's some things that we're going to re- we need to research. We need to look at how previous laws that were passed, are they being implemented correctly? And then new issues like this mm-hmm. that come up, it gives kind of a, of a, of a blueprint of what the legislative session is going to look like. I was surprised that they had, you know, that they were able to put uh, um, this squatting issue on there. Um, it says, secure Texas against squatters, review current laws relating to squatters or those claiming adverse possession of property, make recommendations to streamline the process for the immediate removal of squatters and to strengthen the rights of property owners. What does that tell you, Derek? 
<clears throat> tells me there's going to be a law that's going to uh, expedite the removal of squatters and strengthen the rights of property owners. Probably, <laughs> probably going to be passing in uh, late March. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, yeah. basically the first week of mm-hmm. uh, of regular session. No. So, uh, d- but but does this mean? I mean, I guess the way the the way that the, from like talking about the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Does this mean? Hopefully, I think this means, and the way that this should work is if someone's trying to squat on your property, you call the authorities, and the authorities know that their job is to go and remove the squatters off of your property yeah. and that's it and if they resist or they whatever you take the necessary action if they need to be jailed or whatever but the point is the law is on your side law enforcement is going to be there to support you and they're going to remove the squatters i think the one problem though with that assessment though i think the first half is absolutely correct and the fact that law enforcement will i mean again there's going to be there has to be a modicum of due process you're, you're gonna to have to somehow demonstrate that you have an ownership interest in that property and that probably also demonstrate as well that it's not a rental property or, or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be and then i think once that box is checked the individual's room now the, the subsequent part's the deterrent part right you know is there should also be at i think there's i think it's currently at the lowest level a class b uh, misdemeanor for trespass the places where this is going to be the biggest problem are not the places that are going to start prosecuting for trespass. They're places that are letting far worse things go right now, such as Travis County. Um, mm-hmm. And so I don't think there's really going to be uh, there's there's going to be a process, but there's not going to be necessarily be justice for it. So you mentioned Travis County, who just announced that um, that the mutilation of, of minors for for transition treatments or whatever is going to be a low priority for them to prosecute. I can't imagine chance that squatters is going to be that high on the list in Travis County. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> property rights historically have been the redheaded stepchild of the rights to get protection through the judicial system. Mm -hmm. Um, And the wheels of justice often move far, far more slowly than we would like. And that's really the problem, is that you have a lot of places, you already have processes to get people out of homes that are squatting. Um, But if it takes six months or eight months or 18 months to actually work through those processes, then what really is the point? And so the trick is going to be getting a policy that has some real teeth and a Mm -hmm. real enforcement mechanism to actually force it through um, a judicial system that isn't always willing to move quickly when it comes to property rights. And the scenario I just, go ahead. No, No, I I was gonna say, you would like to see that like, you know, especially with the categorical uh, declarations of office, much like the one you mentioned about the the trans um, issue, you know, you'd like to to hope that uh, HB 17 you know, erased uh, erased a lot of that, but again, to Chance's point, is that you still have this this litany of process that comes afterwards. Here in this particular case, called the uh, hold the district attorney accountable. Yeah, that you're probably just not going to see it. Now, the good thing is about that particular law is it's not incumbent upon local prosecutors to enforce that law. That is solely a law. And, and, and of course, you know, this, if you listen to what the activists say, they say that, oh, this is basically the jackbooted thugs will uh, show up and throw them in prison. But what that law does is it simply penalizes the medical practitioners within the state. Mm-hmm. You know, it has nothing to do with, you know, parents or anything like that. So I think that's just grand. St- that particular yeah. instance is grandstanding on. And it is Garza's two different behalf. issues in terms of prosecutorial discretion versus what the cops do when you call them. Yeah. And I think for most people, if it takes 18 months to get to put this guy through the system because he trespassed on my property, I don't I mean, whatever. I don't yeah. you know, that's I mean, maybe it happens. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. What I really need is for when I show up and he's there, I need the cops to show up and get him out of that my was house. the point that I was making if the process to get someone removed is 18 months or, or 20 right. you know like and that's what you see a lot in a lot of these property cases even on the civil side to get something that, that moves well, then what's the point? Right. Yeah. yeah. So so it's so you have the issue of the, of the prosecutor in Travis County who may not necessarily yeah. prosecute the case, but what you know, there are things that they can do in the law that'll that'll you know tighten up and make sure that the, you know local law enforcement knows that, that that's the rule is that mm-hmm. they need to show up and that they need to. I mean, is there anything at the the is there any kind of tension between uh, local law enforcement and what the state could could legislate that would allow the the cops to show up and say, well, we don't really know what we're supposed to do because our prosecutor is telling us one thing but the loss is the other thing well I, th- I think that you just have to look at the the incentives for uh, or the incentives on law enforcement's behalf you know because I, everyone tries to uh, well we can't obviously can't paint prosecutors with a you know a monolithic brush because obviously the you know the prosecutor in Lubbock County and the prosecutor in Travis County probably fairly radically different in their approaches to uh, enforcing the law Law enforcement's largely, since it's a composite entity, is largely 
even in uh, liberal jurisdictions, fairly moderate to even center right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there would be much more of a uh, an eye towards this. Now, I mean, we can talk about other issues of uh, property rights vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement, civil as a forfeiture. We discussed a million times, you know, where that might not be the case. But even so, I think that with something like this, something that's that could just as easily happen to one of their friends or family members. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're going to see a lot more enforcement or willingness to enforce, I should say, on the law enforcement side. Um, Chance, we, we are uh, really, really appreciate you coming in and talking to us about this issue. And, and late, we will keep an eye on this. Obviously, the interim charges will come out. There'll be some research and reports. And so we'll come back and, and revisit yeah. this issue when all that comes out. We have about 10 minutes left, and we like to do something fun at the end of the show to kind of leave on a high note, because a lot of times it's a lot of doom and gloom here about the about about things. And so, you mean anyway, squatting is not a high note? Yeah, well, well, especially because there's no resolution, because we don't really know. <laughs> you know, we're waiting for the, the laws to come out. But if you'll stick with us, we'll mm -hmm. go through a couple of different segments. Mm -hmm. um, one of the is new segment. I want to. We talk about polling a lot on the show, so we just figured, hey, let's just have a segment about it because it's something that I like. I think you know a lot of political insiders love you know catnip, the catnip of polls and things like that. And this one's actually kind of related uh, to. But um, all right, so survey says the new the a new co Emerson College poll came out. Uh, it's a little bit shocking and maybe have some political ramifications for the election this year. Seventy five percent of voters think that the cost of living in the United States is rising. Just eighteen percent think that it's staying the same, and only seven percent think that the that the cost of living is easing Derek I think this is a huge number I mean I think there's a yeah seven percent margin of error yeah yeah <laughs> seven 75 yeah right seven percent uh, think it's easing uh, 75 percent of voters think that cost of living in the United States that is a huge mm -hmm. barometer mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of times in polling we look at you know what what people say about the economy it's not really that they're saying chance that that the economy is bad because they look at GDP yeah. numbers or whatever yeah. or whatever it's really just sort of a, a general feeling about the direct of the country. Mm. Uh, and so, Derek, your thoughts on 75%. Do you think this is a huge harbinger for, for the rest of the year? Oh, well, I mean, I, th I think if you just look at, you know, the polling and not just, you know, recent polling, you know, where the, the actual pinch from the inflation has happened. But, you know, from the last, say, two years, you know, the, ec the economy has been such a millstone around President Biden's neck, and, and rightfully so, because many of the policies have, have, have exacerbated. I'm not one of these ones that the president fully dictates economic behavior and inflation, stuff like that. Not saying that at all. They definitely can make it worse, and I think that there's an argument that that's what we've actually seen. What I think this is more reflective of, because this is where you get the, you know, you know Paul Krugmans of the world trying to throw people off the scent, saying, oh, yeah, you know, this is just, you know, greedy corporations, you know, your Snickers bar is getting smaller, things like that. No, this is like, this is... <laughs> This is something where people are going to believe their lying eyes on this particular mm -hmm. thing because you're not they're not going to be rationed away that things are getting or rationalized away that things are actually getting cheaper. And that one of the issues that I think that are that the, the independent confirmation that I think you see on this is, well, they remember the, the time that inflation instead of roaring just kind of simmered down a little bit and still above average but yeah. you know is when they started oh this is the success of bidenomics they've since abandoned that because <laughs> i'm talking about a toxic well, brand well remember when they were like they said that hot dogs went down 11 cents and then everybody should be you know excited about that it's exactly <laughs> it was exactly back it was exactly the same i can't remember if it was i think it was right at towards the beginning of um the biden administration where they the uh as Council of Economic Advisors, somebody tweeted out a graph of gas prices going down. Mm. That was literally a two-month observation. It was there yeah. and there, and, it's, and, and then, then when you, you widen it yeah, out, you zoom, it's like, you zoom out, and it's like, oh, this is the other side of the <laughs> yeah. peak of the Matterhorn. Okay, well, that's what I was going to ask you about, Chance. I mean, the White House is sending out everybody they can to try and convince people that again, they're lying eyes. Yeah, that, all these graphs and charts, and look at all these numbers and whatever, and yet we all go to the grocery store and we spend three times as much as we did, to, you know, three years ago. So you said you said it was eighteen percent. The uh, said it's staying the same. Staying the same. Only seven percent think the cost is easing. So eighteen percent either don't buy their groceries <laughs> or can't do basic math. Yeah. Right. I mean that's right. It, it, everything's more expensive than it was. If mm -hmm. you go and get a gallon of milk, it's more expensive. If you get hamburger, it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. If you buy gas, it's more expensive. I mean, I 
I had to drive in this morning and buy gas, and it's not cheap. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, w- my wife and I'll try to have like a random date night or whatever, and go out yeah. and and uh, and you know, go out to eat or whatever. And now we have to think about really think about where we're going again, yeah. because I mean, it could be the difference between you know seventy or eighty bucks and almost two hundred dollars yeah. at some at some places. It's insane. Yeah, what it costs to just go out and and try and you know have a meal you know outside the house. So Taco Cabana is going from every month to every <laughs> other month. Is what I'm hearing. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a romantic at home. <laughs> well, Taco going, Caban is a solid date. I don't know what you're uh, talking as long, as long as, again, you, you, you can't follow uh, Krugman's advice. Like, oh, just go to Taco Bell, and it's, it's just not the same. <laughs> but I, I think that I, I think that aside from the branding thing, one of the things to remember is, and, and, I, and I tell folks on the right this all the time, is that they think that, uh, again, much like the, the errant perception that one election caused all this trouble, mm-hmm. Is that the one election will fix all this trouble? And the pro- thing you got to remember about inflation is it's not like a, a, let's say that we hit, hit the magic reset button and go back to uh, 2017 or, or or whenever it was that where prices are now, there might be a slow letting air out of the balloon. They're not going back though. Mm-hmm. You know the the, the days that uh, a value meal at McDonald's was you know seven bucks or whatever. Those days are gone. Yeah, those will never come back. And the thing is, and what I think the real errancy on the part of the Obama or sorry, <laughs> Biden administration, uh, Freudian, oh, the, glory, oh, the yeah, old days, yeah, Fro- <laughs> Freudian slip there. My bad. Um, <laughs> is that you know the the errancy on there is that. They're bragging about a slowing, uh, you know, a backing off of the throttle on inflation, mm-hmm. saying it's still rising a lot faster than it has or even that the even the Fed would want. But they're doing so in a way, spiking the football on the, yeah, but it's not as bad as it was. Right. And it's like, yes, but it's still much, much worse than it was, depending on where you put that frame. All right. Shifting topics into another new segment that we have that's called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. Uh, yes. We look at some research <laughs> that maybe TVBF or others, uh, some of our coalition partners are doing. Um, you, you mentioned this earlier, bringing up James Quintero and the, and the superintendents. Chance, would it shock you to find out that there are 91 Texas superintendents, 91 Texas superintendents uh, in the state that make $300,000 or more? Well, you know I work at TPPF, right? Like, no, <laughs> so it's just it doesn't, yeah. yeah, no, Never government, came up. <laughs> government bureaucrats making a lot of money. That sounds three hundred thousand right. dollars. There's all, there's nearly a hundred superintendents, and granted, we have a lot of school districts. We have like twelve hundred school districts or more, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But still, that seems like a lot. I mean, then you go down and even you know go down and look at those just making two hundred thousand dollars or more. Which again, th- these numbers put all of these folks in the one percent that is a staggering amount of money for a government bureaucrat yeah that is that is a ton and then and then to make matters worse i mean that's that alone you're just sort of like mind-boggling but that brings up a couple of issues one is you know you have the left saying well we need more money we need more money that's why you know the the um you know we're underfunded and all this kind of stuff well when you have that level of bureaucracy if you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars and i mean and w- what is everybody underneath of them making it's not like they're making four or five hundred thousand dollars and then the next guy's making fifty Although that is the teachers, the teachers yeah. are the ones making the the thirty and forty thousand dollars. But all the bureaucracy mm-hmm. that goes along with that. Well, also it's it's getting paid that much when no one's happy with the product that you're producing. <laughs> right. And like it, in the private market, you would not be getting raises when the product you're producing sucks. Yeah. So let's get into that because again, this is the research portion. We're not just going to throw out uh, these things. So I looked at the top ten um, uh, highest paid. Um, uh, superintendents and looked at their school districts, Derek, um, in Isleta uh, district, they're the third highest, they have the third highest paid uh, superintendent. Uh, they're only do the, the children there are only, only 44% can do math at grade mm-hmm. level. Uh, only 50, <laughs> how many of the administrators can? <laughs> yeah. Only, only 51% can, can read at grade level. Here's, here's studying the, the fifth highest super in, paid superintendent at Garland ISD, only 38% of the kids in that district can do math at grade level. You go down to the 10th highest paid uh, superintendent in Duncanville, only 27%. This person makes $392,000 a year, and only 27% of their kids can do math at grade level. And and reading is only at 41%. So to Chance's point, we're paying all this money for what? Well, first of all, I think that's some them great uh, some great digging. And, you know, we don't have a spot for you on the policy team if this comp thing no, doesn't no, work no, out. No, 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 no. That's, um, that's the extent of my research right there. That's all. <laughs> well, I, well, hey, it, it was good. It was, it was definitely good while it lasted. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, so so that chance's point is exactly spot on. Is that people 
are not satisfied with the price. There are definitely some people that are, you know, I, and, I, and I would say, just given, you know, the, the four digits count of school districts that we have, I guarantee that we do have a, school, a superintendent out there that's making an awful lot of money and the vast majority of the people are very satisfied with it and mm-hmm. the kids are achieving. I, I guarantee I, that exists I'll somewhere. give you one. Cypress yeah. Fairbanks, they're the number one. Their, their guy makes $536,000 and yet you've got, and, uh, but the numbers and It's also are a really big district. Too. It's a huge district, right? And it's, it's outside of here. And a lot of the Harris County ones make sense in terms of just because of the sheer Size volume. and density, yes. but, there, but at least you've got 70-some percent that are reading at grade level. You've got 60-some percent that are in the high 60s that are that are doing math at grade level. These are 20 and 30 points higher than some of these guys who are just underneath of it. What a, look up uh, on your list there, uh, Barber's Hill. I remember the jump. Yeah, at. Barber's Hill is second, and they're they're uh, he the, he's making four hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars with what, a, with a what year. enrollment? Uh, well, the enrollment has just seventy seven hundred kids, and he's so, making and he's making. Now the the grades are good. The grades are, are in decent shape, mm-hmm. but yeah, four hundred seventy seven thousand dollars, and there's seventy seven hundred kids versus mm-hmm. Cypress Fairbanks, which has one hundred and eighteen thousand kids. Do we know what teacher salaries are in those districts? We can we can definitely we'll get to that on the next show. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I think that matters. I mean, what what do you think is more important to a kid reading at grade level, having a good teacher mm-hmm. or you know, the guy who sits in the cubicle and tells everybody when yeah. to show up. And these are the people who come before and testify the or come before the committees yeah. and testify that and they're mad at the the legislature for not, you know, earmarking teacher salaries uh, in the in the budget and yet they go home to their five hundred and seventy seven thousand dollar job. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I made this point on a panel on Wednesday, is that we have decided and again this is the structuring of Texas that we decided back in the 1800s, that we are going to fund local institutions locally, obviously through the property tax, and which we discuss many other times. But that's the thing. And so we give, you know, we give local control to these entities, and they decide to put up bonds that they don't need for natatoriums and stadiums. They decide to pay these lavish salaries for, you know, to your point, if that guy's making 500000 what's the director of cardboard pizza procurement making right. at the district office? Right. We, just, we do all that, and then they have the temerity to come rattle the tin cup at the legislature? Yeah. Or compl- or complain about property taxes that they are that they are the ones setting the rate <laughs> Why for are these property taxes so high. What to pay your freaking salary? It's it's, a, it's, it's that meme with the uh, hot dog guy going. We're all trying to figure <laughs> yeah. out who did this. La Jolla district. They uh, well, there was a you know a couple years ago there was a big um, uh, a controversy because the there was either I think I'm not sure if that one was the golden parachute one where they left and end up seven hundred thousand well, dollars. La Jolla was golden parachute water park and golf course. Water park and golf course. So spending all that money. There's another one where we found out that someone was getting. Now, not only a thousand dollar a month housing stipend, but also a thousand dollar a month car stipend. Wow. Like you know, I mean, I have a pretty nice car, but it's nowhere near like a thousand dollars a month. Like, what are you getting for your car for a thousand? Is she driving around a Mercedes or some Maybach or something? <laughs> you know. Um. But but again, it's it, you know these these massive salaries. And again, La Jolla, you've got only forty one percent can do math at grade level. Only forty one percent can do reading at grade level. And so uh, this is the kind of thing that frustrates people. That you know, especially those of us who are working on these policies and hearing from the left constantly that, that the districts don't have any money and then these kind of statistics and come out. And pretending that, look, public service is supposed to be to a certain extent a sacrifice. You realize when you go out of the private sector into the public sector that you're supposed to be giving something up, like, you know, $500,000 salaries. Mm. And so to come in and have the sanctimony, to come in and pretend that you're this public servant that's sacrificing and therefore you need to be treated with the respect that comes along with that sort of virtue when at the same time you have a thousand dollar car stipend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we are running out of time here. I want to get to the last news segment that we have. What are you watching, Derek? What's coming up in the next couple of weeks that you want folks to know about? Well, I know I know what you're gonna say, but I have to <laughs> say that parallel to that, one of the big things, and I think that'd be really important to well, see. Well, do you want me to do mine first then? Okay, I'll do yours first. Okay, I'll do mine. The one thing I'm watching, <laughs> one thing I'm very excited about is uh, of course we passed, it was SB seventeen was mm. the was the anti DEI programs at public universities, um, which has been implemented and there's been some controversy over whether or not they're actually being implemented. Uh, well Senator Brandon Creighton, who oversees that committee in the Senate, is calling in some of the heads of the universities to to have them detail what they've done over the last four months to actually start 
start to implement those policies. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really is where you have the, the holding you know, these universities accountable for they're going to have hearings um, uh, at the early part of May. And so obviously we'll be covering that and we'll be uh, interested in what they have to say there and whether or not they can actually say, yes, we're, we're, we're following the law or if there's going to be some, some fireworks. Yeah, and allow me to yes end that because that I think is probably the number one thing that most people uh, that that pay attention to in this world are are, are waiting for. Uh, one of the things and we talked about this uh, on the show with uh, with Mr. Bonson, um, the this DEI thing is is just so, just so pernicious. And then you've seen you know the the uh, rending of garments and gnashing of teeth when these you know sixty one or uh, you know the numbers vary uh, administrators uh, have gotten laid off by UT. The f everyone's up in arms like, can you believe they laid off? Sigma? I'm like, I can't believe that they had the that there were sixty one people whose job descriptions were so on the nose and vi flagrant violation of the law that even the administration laid them off. Like yeah, that's yeah. that's what I find surprising. But to to say I, I wouldn't want to say second fiddle because it's it's definitely. Um, a very key importance is similarly uh, there's going to be water hearings uh, in the Senate um, and I think that you know some of the direction that we see uh, that policy discussion going is going to have uh, serious implications for the state I think that the Senate uh, I believe that's shared if I recall correctly by uh, Senator Perry um, I, and, you know, obviously from the Lubbock area, obviously <laughs> knows well of the scarcity of water, specifically up in the panhandle. But I think that there's going to be a really good discussion on that. We're going to start seeing what does a Texas water plan. I'm not just talking about creating an account for it. What does an actual Texas water plan look like? And I think that's going to have impact for the better, the lives of many Texans. Good stuff. <clears throat> Chance, anything on your plate uh, the next couple of weeks that are that you're watching or any cases that you're break gonna, dancing? Gonna be? We're, little, little definitely break. the break that's, dancing. Not until August. Not till August. Also, they've added <laughs> surfing to the Olympics as well, so I'll be watching that. Uh, Isn't that like going on in like yeah. Polynesia or something? Yeah, and I always watch the boxing. I always watch the boxing. No, but um, what we're watching right now is we're waiting to see if the Texas Supreme Court is going to take our ETJ case. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are familiar, we've argued that cities regulating outside of their borders and regulating what you can do with your property when you don't live in the city and don't pay and sorry don't receive any services and can't vote we think that sort of regulation without representation is unconstitutional and so we're waiting to see if the tech supreme court's going to take it this summer that's that's good radio right there we come full circle back to property taxes <laughs> right where we started um well we're a chance again we really appreciate you taking time to come down and uh, and and talk to us about this issue that's kind of exploding uh, all over the country so hopefully people got some new information and know that, that texas is working on it and, and hopefully we'll get it right so um for those of you watching and listening we really appreciate it of course you can <clears throat> if you have any topics for the show or or you have any feedback for us you can always find us online um, at Twitter or X or whatever it's now so we really appreciate your feedback on that even the even the haters we love you guys uh, coming out and uh, letting us know that you liked or didn't like whatever it is that you heard or saw so we really appreciate you appreciate you uh, listening and watching and as always in the words of Sam Houston do good and risk the consequences we'll see you next time